Well, I've got three kids. Gina and I have three kids, 21, 20, and 14. But it seems like just yesterday that we were in the chaotic Christmas morning. Everybody know what I'm talking about with the chaotic Christmas morning? Remember one year in particular where the boys got Star Wars toys and Anna got a, a, a dollhouse, like a huge dollhouse kind of thing. And of course you wrap everything and they rip off the wrapping paper and oh, this is great. They get out the toy and they're playing with it for about five minutes. You know, they're little and then they start playing with the box, you know, and they spend more time with the box than the toy, right? We've all been there, right? And then they discovered that all of that wrapping paper that's laying around you can wad it up and make a mighty cool snowball out of that. So they get into those snowball fights right out there, and then they find the, the, the little tubes that the wrapping paper came in. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Pretty soon we have Star Wars live and in action right in our living room. I miss those days. It was such chaos. It was so much fun. And so, you know, in time, no, no time soon, but in time I look forward to being a granddaddy because you get to relive all of that chaos. It's so much fun. You know, somebody recently published a study that said that grandkids are living proof that children are hereditary. If your parents didn't have any, chances are you won't either. Think about it. It's working its way from the front to the back. I can tell. It's getting there. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the chaos of Christmas is so much fun. But who wants a chaotic day every day? Does anybody want the chaos of Christmas to move beyond Christmas morning? Because, you know, Christmas afternoon, we need a nap, especially the grandparents, right? You need a nap, you know? But the chaos, the chaos of Christmas is just a small microcosm of the chaos that could be if it weren't for Advent. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1, and we're spending four weeks in Colossians 1 leading up to Christmas because it's so easy to think that Christmas begins and ends with a baby in a manger. It's so easy to think that Christmas is all just about the stars and the wise men and Mary and Joseph and all of that. But what Colossians 1 does, it shows us a bigger Jesus. It shows us a bigger picture of who Jesus is. And so Advent is, is the time in the church calendar where we focus on who Jesus is. And Colossians 1 is probably the most articulate and concise picture of Jesus himself. So we're going to dive into it. Like I said, we've been in it last week. We looked at that the gospel was more than just Christmas. Today we're going to look at how Jesus is more than just Christmas. We're going to read this together. In fact, if you don't mind, let's stand together as we read a rather long passage, but we're going to see a few very key things in this. Let's read this together, Colossians 1, verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. And then Paul shifts, shifts focus here for just a minute, and he says this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen. You may be seated. If you're at home, you can be seated too. We don't know if you stood or not, but we'll give you the benefit. All right. So when we see in that, there's Paul midway through 9 and 17 shifts gears. And what he's saying in there is Jesus is the king. 
in the second half of that, the, he's saying that Jesus is the king. And in the first part of that, we're going to see how Jesus can be your king. So Jesus is the king of the cosmos, but he can also be your king of your cosmos. Let's think about this just a little bit. Jesus is the king. Now, in this passage, it doesn't actually say Jesus is the king, but throughout the rest of the scriptures, we see that. We see that Jesus riding into Jerusalem, behold your king. We see it throughout the prophecies. He is a king. But Paul alludes to it here. He says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us, transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. Jesus can be the king of our kingdom, the king of our cosmos. We'll come back to that because in the next section there, he says, for in him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Everybody say all. At home, you can do it too. Okay. All things hold together through him. Now, we're going to see this more as we think this through. But so many times, we have a tendency to forget that all things hold together in him. In fact, Isaiah had to remind us of that. He said this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. To which we say, Democrat or Republican. To which we say, a fiefdom like what happened in Saudi Arabia or maybe a kingship, as in what happens in other places, especially like in Britain. To which we say, you mean a, a democratically elected government? Or some other kind of autocratic government? Communism? What, what kind of government are you talking about here? And see, that's where we think too small of our Jesus. You see, the government rests upon his shoulders. It means that the cosmos the governing, the ruling, the caring for the entire cosmos, the entire universe, everything that is rests upon his shoulders. This is our God. This is our Jesus. This is the one who was born in the manger. And Isaiah goes on and he says, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his, there's that word again, government. And peace, there will be no end. What Paul is telling us here is that Jesus is the king of the cosmos. And he can be your king as well. See, one thing that we have to remember is that when we, when we read these letters in the Bible, Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, these were all letters written by Paul to people in particular places. And so one thing we have to remember about that is that while they are full of amazing theology, in other words, we learn things about God through these letters that we wouldn't know any other way because they're divinely inspired by God to reveal himself to us, but they were also written to specific people at a specific time. That's what they mean. They are pastoral letters. In other words, Paul is telling us these incredible macro things about God, the theology of God, but he's also applying it to the people that he's writing it to. And so when Paul says this, he says, he is before all things. The people in Colossians, now to us, we're like, well, yeah, we, we know that. The people in Colossians didn't necessarily know that because they lived in a world that was saturated with what they call polytheism. Polytheism is many, many gods. In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, they were saturated with a worldview of polytheism, many, many gods. In fact, you, you read through the Old Testament especially, and the people are always turning away from the true God to worship a false god. There were many, many different gods, little g, in their world. In fact, the Greek and the Roman thought about who God was to people that, that were living in Colossae was that God emanated from his creation. In other words, 
gods of stone, gods of wood, gods of fire, gods of rain, all of those things, they could come out of, out of the world, and they saw them as gods. And what Paul is saying to them in no uncertain terms is the very same thing that, that God spoke through the writer of Genesis 1. When he said, in the beginning, God created. Paul says that he is before all things. That means that before Christmas, he was. That means before Advent, he was. That means that before Genesis 1, he was. He was before all things. Everything was made by him. And we sort of sit here and we go, so, and, yeah, we get that. Well, it hadn't always been that way, even in the church. We haven't always understood what they call the preeminence of Jesus, that he was before all things. There was a guy named Arius in 250. He lived from 250 to 336. Now, I have to be careful not to go too far down this rabbit hole because I love this stuff, but it's important that we understand the power of the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Arius was a guy who was teaching heresy. But it was getting a lot of traction. And the core of his her heresy, his falseness, his, his cancer for the church, was that God created Jesus. That God himself created Jesus sometime later on and that Jesus did not pre-exist, that he was not before all things. Now, they gathered together in this town called Nicaea, to talk, all of the church fathers gathered in this town called Nicaea to talk about what Arius was teaching and to say, Arius, I, 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 don't, I don't think you're teaching the right thing about this because we all know that Jesus was before. That's what he said throughout the Gospels before Abraham, I am. How can you possibly be teaching something else? But people were listening. And so Arius in the Council of Nicaea stood up and he starts talking this blasphemy about who Jesus was. And there was a guy in the back of the room, and legend has this, that this guy in the back of the room walked forward and cold-cocked Arius right in the mouth. And he said, nobody's going to talk my, about my Jesus that way. And that guy was St. Nicholas. Now that's a St. Nick I can get behind. I've never seen that picture in the front yard of anybody with a sleigh and reindeer behind it. <laughs> from that council, from that meeting, came something that the church has celebrated and repeated often for 2,000 years. The Nicene Creed. And in that Nicene Creed, it's one of the confessions, it's one of the things that says, if you're going to be a Jesus follower, you need to understand, you need to confess this. They say this, begotten, not made. One in substance with the Father, through him all things were made. And that's just a repeat, a, a quote of our passage this morning in Colossians 1. It says, for in him all things were created. Things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things, this is so key, hold together. All things hold together. When I was in, in school, I had to read a book by a guy named David Hume. And David Hume was a very, very famous agnostic atheist, okay? Very articulate, very smart, not, not at all wise, but very smart. And in one of his, his treaties, I don't know if you call them sermons, I don't know what, talks, whatever you call it, he talked about how evidence for God was so hard to find, but at the same time it could not be denied. And one of the major parts that he kept stumbling over was the order of nature. In other words, there is an order to nature that cannot be explained any other way other than somebody is in charge. There is an orderliness to nature, he said, that says that if today you boil water at this temperature and tomorrow you boil it, it will boil at the same temperature. 
There is an orderliness to, to nature that says, if you're going to freeze at 32 degrees, tomorrow you're going to freeze at the same 32 degrees. The orderliness of nature is what gives us confidence to get on an airplane. You ever think about that? If nature wasn't orderly, we would have no confidence that the laws of aerodynamics are going to work from Monday to Tuesday. So we might look at it and say, well, on Monday the plane flew, but I don't know about today because nature, cosmos, is chaotic. But it's not. But it's not because, see, in him all things hold together. In him the governments hold together. In him the world holds together. In him the universe holds together. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, both the physical and the moral order. What do we mean by that? It's easy to say, well, this thing is going to probably be just as strong tomorrow as it is today because there are physical laws, there is physical nature, there's a physical order at work here. But what does it mean about the invisible? Think of this for a moment. Is anybody in the room in love? Come on, you can raise your at home, you can do it. It's no fun without you. Raise your hand. Is anybody in love? I'm definitely in love. I love my wife, right? I'm definitely in love. Why? Why are we able to love at all? I mean, if you think about it, if there's not some sort of order, if there's not some sort of creation, if there's not something holding it all together, why would we be able to love? Why would we not just be lumps of whatever walking around? First John tells us we love because he first loved us. We would not have the capacity to love if we did not have a creator who is above all things holding all things together. That's part of those things that are visible as well as those things that are invisible. And it is in Him that we find our love. It is in Him that we have our being. And you see, that's what our passage is saying. For on Him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible. We love simply because He first loved us. Apart from Him, we could not love. And you see, that's the created order. That's what he did for creation. He is the king. All things hold together through him, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. And you might say, well, what about hurricanes? What about fires? What about all of these other things that come against us? And David Hume and other atheists as well as theologians would say that just proves, that just proves the created order. Because without the created order, those things would be normal. But as we know, those things are abnormal. He put them all together. There is a physical, a moral, and a spiritual, invisible and visible order that is held together by him. He is that king. He is the king of kings. So let me ask you, is he your king? Is he your king? Because Jesus is the king of all. Is he your king? So kind of getting us back to the front yard, to the stable, to, to Christmas, to all of that, in Matthew 2, there's a story about wise men, the magi, whatever you want to call them, and they come and they get to Jerusalem. Remember this story? Everybody tracking with me? You know, you know what I'm talking about? They show up, and they show up in front of King Herod. Now, King Herod was a king, and King Herod thought that he was the king. But look at this. He says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? And Herod's like, right here. Uh, what, what you talking about? I'm right here. What do you mean? I am the king of the Jews. What are you talking about? They go, no, 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 no. There, there's another one. And Herod's like, there ain't no other king. I'm the king. There's not room in my kingdom for more than one king. 
And if he really said that, he would have been saying some truth there. Because in our own kingdoms, in our own life, in our own world, in the way that we live our life, in the things that we think, there's only room for one king. Just as in Herod's kingdom, there was only room for one king. In our kingdom, there's only room for one king. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all of Jerusalem with him. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because Herod got upset. The rest of the town got upset because Herod's upsetness, Herod's unwillingness to allow more than one king in his life created ripple effects all the way around him. And all of Jerusalem was upset about, the, about this thing. And you know what, folks? If you're a dad... You got too many kings in your life, it creates ripple effects in your household. It creates ripple effects in your life. It creates ripple effects in your children. It creates ripple effects beyond. Moms, if, if there's more than one king in your life, it creates ripple effects in the way you treat others, the way you treat your children. If there's more than one king in your life, it affects the way you treat your finances. It's the way it affects your future. It's the way it affects your past. It affects everything. So just as Herod, not willing to accept another king, created turbulence and turmoil and problems and disturbed all around Jerusalem when we, when we refuse to accept God's kingship, Jesus himself's kingship, it creates ripples through all. Is he your king? Is Jesus your king? Because we know that he is the king of all. But he can be your king as well. Mark Twain was quoted one time when, when someone asked him about the Bible. He said this, it ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do. What are those parts that need to come under the kingship of Jesus Christ today? What are those parts of our heart that we hold on to and say, yeah, God, you're, you're the king. Absolutely, I can sing the songs. I can, I can I, yeah, but you're not going to get that. I'm going to hold on to that. Tim Keller puts it this way. He said, to the degree that you have your life under the kingship of Christ, to that degree, your life will hold together. Your life will hold together. And you say, what about this weird COVID time? I've lost my job. I've lost so much. What about cancer that comes in? What about, what about illness? What about other things? And you see, those things can still come into your life, but how do you react to them? You see, if he is the king of your life, if he is not only the king of the cosmos and he's bringing order to the cosmos, he'll also bring order to our world because he is the king and all things were made through him for him and by him and for his good pleasure so we don't necessarily control the things that enter into our kingdom but we certainly control the way we respond so how do we how do we enjoy that kind of kingship how are, how are we transferred as the bible says how are we transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and it's so interesting because he gives us this passage. He says, because you are qualified, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. When you read the book of John, um, there's a, a fellow there named John the Baptist when you read all the Gospels, John the Baptist is very, very big in the Gospels. In fact, he is so big that Jesus himself said, Jesus himself said this, he said, there has been no man greater born of a woman until John the Baptist. Wow, that's pretty huge. That, that, that's like a pretty high level here. And yet John the Baptist, John the Baptist said this about Jesus. He said, there is one coming who I am not even qualified to unlace his sandals. There is one coming that is so great, so powerful, so mighty, 
so holy that I'm not even qualified to stoop before him and do a menial task. Don't let this word qualified slip by too quickly. Paul chose this word very, very carefully because he, he didn't say giving joyful thanks to the Father who has allowed people to earn your share in the inheritance. He says qualified. How are we qualified to come into the kingdom? How are we qualified to be able to to come under Him and to allow Him to hold all things together, not only in the universe, but in our life, in our heart, in our world as well? How are we possibly qualified for that. Let me give you a weird illustration here. This, this is strange, but just follow me here. We'll get back to, the, to, to this in just a minute. In the late 1800s, they discovered a new fish. Um, it, it was a fish that le- lives in the deepest, deepest, darkest ocean. And it's got this little lantern that hangs over its head. Everybody know what I'm talking about there? The, the, the anglers know what I'm talking about. It's got a name, but I don't remember the name. But it's such a funky creature lives in the deep, 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 five-mile deep parts of the ocean. And they didn't discover it until the mid-1800s because what happened was the fish died, and very, very, very slowly he rose up from the bottom of the ocean. So slowly that the pressures and everything that were, the, the lighter pressure didn't tear him apart. You see, if he would have just popped right up, he would have been blown apart by the pressure. But as it was, he rose slowly over the course of a year, and then he washed up, and somebody looked at it and said, what is this? And about 40, 50 years later, they actually were able to discover that this was actually a creature, a sea creature, a fish that lived five miles below the surface. And in his environment, he could survive. But taken out of his environment, he literally blew up. He was torn apart by the pressure. Folks, we were created, we were created like Adam and Eve, we were created to live in an environment, in an environment blessed in perfect union with God himself. And when Adam and Eve chose to know rather than to trust, that environment skewed, and it created pressures, and it created sin, and it created problems that we just were not built to handle. But in that environment, we are held together. So how do we move from being unqualified to be back in that environment to being qualified? Because the one who holds it all together was torn apart for us. The one who created all that is and holds it together willfully went to the cross for us and was torn apart for our sins, for our transgressions, for our messes. And he who never did anything was torn apart so that we could come together under him. In Genesis 17, there's a fascinating, fascinating thing reported there. You see, God made a covenant with Abraham, and he said, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be your God forever and ever. I am going to be your God. And to prove it, I'm going to allow you to hold me to the covenant. And the way that they did that then, they would take an animal, like a sheep or or an oxen or something, and they would take the animal and they would rip it to shreds. They would pull the leg off and throw one leg on one side of the path and one on the other. And they'd rip the other leg and do the same thing. A bloody mess. And then God himself came down and walked through that path, that bloody path of the animal being torn apart on either side of the path. And he made a covenant with Abraham and he said, you know what? If I ever break this covenant, You have the right to tear me limb from limb and throw me on the path. But, Abraham, if you ever break this covenant, 
I have the right to tear you apart. And Christ Himself, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the earth, came apart on the cross so that we could come together under His kingship. He who holds it all together came apart for us so that we could be held together in Him. You see, that's what this table is all about. When we gather at this table, when we take this bread and we break it and say, this is my body which is broken for you, it was in fulfillment of that covenant. It was in fulfillment that He became sin for us. He was torn apart for us that we could be brought together in Him 